Welcome it, everyone. Hello, everybody. This is Everything Sucks. Let's Fix It, episode 24. My name is Ben Mayer. My name is Anthony Buono. Today is November 14th, 2023, and Anthony's in a bit of a rush. He's got governing to do after this. Yes, for anyone, we've gotten a lot of growth since I've last mentioned this, so I am technically an elected official in the town of Brookline, so I do have to be at the town meeting in a couple couple hours so we're on a tight schedule here yeah so So get into it we'll get into it Mm -hmm. first up we have talks about trump's immigration plan for 2025 if he gets reelected. um trump has been pushing his rhetoric further and further to the right in recent months he's calling his political opponents vermin he is explicitly talking about deep xenophobic policy implementations And he is only getting more radical, and he's only radicalizing his followers more and more as time goes on. Um, It seems to me that the more his legal troubles catch up to him, the further he runs to the right to try to spur up his base into action, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I just want to run down some of his rhetoric that he's been saying about immigration and what his exact policy plan is. If he gets reelected, because I think it's very important that we frame the next election, not as a just referendum on Joe Biden, but we have to realize that there is a larger choice being made here. Um, Not just do we like Joe Biden? Yes or no? Because I would struggle with that question. Mm, It's a yeah, it's a choice about how the people who live in this country are going to be treated based on where they've come from. Yes, exactly. Um, so let's get into the first thing that I want to point out is his deepening, deepening, resenting rhetoric about immigrants. Trump on the campaign trail in Florida said that migrants were poisoning the blood of our country. He compared migrants to Hannibal Lecter, and he said that that is what is coming into our country right now. Poisoning the blood is such a strong, strong phrase. I- I I wish I had a less extreme way to describe it than fascist. Yeah, like there is there's nothing more to describe it other than fascism. You're poisoning the blood of the country. Are we talking about you know the German stock, the American stock? Yeah, the like what are we talking purity about? Purity of our country. It's just insane to me that he says something like that, poisoning the blood. And it's insane to me. Now, honestly, it's not insane to me that he says it. It's insane to me that it isn't being met with as much disdain as it should be. Well, yeah, he says it to a crowd of people that applauds him yeah yeah and so i it just it makes me it makes me nervous that there isn't a repudiation in the republican party against this rhetoric Mm -hmm. because so much of him right now is kind of off the screen i feel like so much of it is just like he's over there doing his thing gonna be the republican nominee and he's not facing criticism for his political stuff only Mm -hmm. for his legal stuff there needs to be more political analysis about what he's saying so people understand that this type of rhetoric isn't normal yes Right? Absolutely. There's too much focus on his legal stuff, which is important, but this is more important. This is how it'll impact you every day. Yeah, definitely. It reminds me of when we talked about the rise of the AFD in Germany, how the center right party will partner with the far right party to gain power and they ignore all of these kind of horrific things. This is what happened with the Nazis in Germany as well, right? Like in looking for that quote unquote big tent, you bring under your tent people who are saying things like migrants are going to be poisoning the blood of our country. Which is insane. Yeah. He has privately mused about militarizing our border the same way Israel militarizes their border with Gaza and suggests that migrants should be shot in the legs if they get caught crossing the border. Mm -hmm. Um, You're not allowed. You can't do that. That's disgustingly vile. The The inhumanity that you have to feel towards these people to think that you can just treat them like that, to even suggest that you have the authority to treat them like that or that it's desirable to treat another human being like that Mm. is a level of dehumanization that only leads to further hatred and eventual extermination. Mm. Where do you go from there if someone is willing to say, yeah, I just want to shoot you for being here? Yeah, it's... It's a dangerous path. I almost want. I want to get through. Yeah, let's go all through of these all points of them. because it's going to make more sense to reflect on it at the end. Yes. So um, he has. He totally wants to suspend the nation's entire refugee program. No more refugees in the whole country. No more refugees. Period. Mm-hmm. He wants to bring back the Muslim travel ban, um, making it impossible for people from uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, or Egypt, Muslim majority countries from making it into the United States completely. Mm -hmm. Um, He wants to top 
uh, flesh piercing spikes on top of uh, the new border wall and paint it totally black. So when they touch the border wall, it burns their skin. Um, so that is his insane rhetoric. That is that is so dystopic. <laughs> like, I, I, I feel like that would be like in the Maze Runner. Yes. You would watch them try to climb the wall of the maze to get out. And then that's what would be waiting for them. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's just so brutal. Um, and he also wants to bring back child separation in its entirety, um, which was the pinnacle of his disgusting immigration programs um, in 2018, 2017. Just so inhumane, like so sad to think about, right? Because you, I understand people are thinking about this as a mode of punishing illegal immigrants. And like at the end of this, I want to get into why, again, why people are so hateful towards immigrants. Because that's like the under the reason he has been able to talk like this in the first place is because the seeds were already there and he just had to water them. Yeah. Um, but this policy of separating kids from their families, people will look at it and judge the policy and, and people on the right who are anti-immigration will judge it positively because they'll think it's effective at deterring immigration right they're, they're thinking what better way to make parents not want to come into the u.s than to do this but i feel like those people are completely forgetting that there are children involved that are being forced to suffer just as punishment for the parents wanting to get a better life for them yeah by any means necessary yeah and if you have family if your family is irish if your family is italian your family is greek eastern european anything like that and you have this type of um uncharitability to migrants coming across the border your ancestors were in their shoes not that long ago yeah you can't forget that this is your story too you just we've come i'm an immigrant i came from uh irish and um italy my ancestors did and greece and I am not going to be a part of this generation who gets into the country and slams the door behind them. I'm not going to do that because mm -hmm. I know that this country gets better with the more people here who are good and decent people. Um, yeah. It's an act of love to choose to come to the United States because you want to make this country better. Mm -hmm. um, so Trump has also gone in on outlining how he will operate a mass deportation campaign, a massive deportation campaign. He wants to up his numbers from 100,000 a year to a million people a year deported. Um, he wants to bring back Tom Hammond, and Tom Hammond ran ICE for the first year and a half of Trump's campaign. He was the biggest proponent of the child separation policies. Um, Tom Hammond um, wants to help organize and run the largest deportation operation this country has ever seen. That's what he's quoting as saying. He wants to run the largest deportation operation the country has ever seen. Now, this is hard because there is a lot of legal trouble that goes into deporting somebody. People can appeal. People can do all this to go to court. Well, Trump wants to get rid of that avenue for migrants entirely. He wants to speed up the deportation process. And to do this, he wants to put all of these people through an expedited removal. Well, what does expedited removal mean? This denies undocumented immigrants the usual hearings and opportunities to file appeals, which can take months or years, especially when people are not in custody. And so this has obviously led to a backlog. He wants to get rid of the immigrant's right to appeal entirely. Um, there is a 1996 law that technically allows this if the person has been here for less than two years, but it has not been used um, in any other circumstances other than initial catches at and around the Rio Grande. Um, Trump tried to do this in his first year, but the Supreme Court shot him down. Now the issue is we have a much more conservative Supreme Court than we did in his first year in office. Mm. So that could totally change. Do you think it would? I, I don't know. I don't know how Amy Coney Barrett feels. I think Amy Coney Barrett might be one that would side with the liberals. Mm. And then the other one would be John Roberts or Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I don't have hope for Brett Kavanaugh. And I don't really have a lot of hope for John Roberts. And I, I barely have hope for Amy Coney Barrett, but I think she's the only one who would side with the liberals in this case. Okay. So Honestly. you think it's more, much more likely that they would let him do it? Yeah, much more likely they would let him do it, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, he also wants to invoke the Alien Enemies Act of 1798. Um, this allows for the deportation of people from countries um, in which the United States is currently at war or have invaded the United States. 
or have had predatory incursions. So think about this. Every time he goes on the campaign trail and he's using the word invasion, that's actually somewhat legal rhetoric. Because if he can sell that what's happening is an invasion, mm -hmm. he can use the Enemies Act of 1789, 1798 to immediately deport all the people right away. Yeah. yeah. So the Supreme Court has also been iffy on this. The Supreme Court has allowed this in wartime, but the Trump administration using this would be the first person that is not using this at wartime, right? Mm -hmm. So... Then this also goes into another issue where Trump always says he wants to go to war with Mexico. Trump has said blatantly he wants to invade Mexico and go to war with the Mexican cartels in, in, in destroying Mexican sovereignty. Well, does then that activate the Enemies Act of 1798 if we're then at war with Mexico yeah. with an American incited war? Yeah, that's the issue. He, if he's president, he can go to war. Right. Exactly. This is no longer hypotheticals. It's his decisions to make. And it's now basically a part of the Republican platform to say goodbye to a Mexican sovereignty entirely yeah. and invade cartels. That's what everyone on the campaign uh, trail is saying. If you ask in the Republican debate, you have DeSantis saying it, Vivek saying it. You have, I don't know if you have Haley saying it, but I imagine she was, she never met a war she didn't like. Yeah. Yeah. I right? would think she would say it. So it's just so difficult. Um, it's hard because Trump himself is a blabbering buffoon who is not competent. But the people that are using him, the people that he's going to appoint, are going to be vicious legal monsters mm. that are going to use every avenue of the law to oppress minorities in any way possible. Trump has said that he will nominate the most hardcore attorneys prepared what it takes to, quote unquote, get this done. Yeah, it's, it's scary because... Again, it feels so typical fascist where these these measures just get more and more extreme and they can affect more and more people. So first you're looking at just illegal immigrants and then eventually you get to this using the Alien Enemies Act. And if you can spin that we've been invaded by, by Mexico, right, or that they've engaged in predatory incursions into the U.S., he can just deport anybody from mexico any mexican migrants yeah right it doesn't anyone matter who has, whether anyone who has an h1a visa or an h1b visa right anyone who is done here legally who has the work permits yeah if they're a mexican national and we're at war with mexico he can use the and he already says he wants to use so like that's what is so frustrating to me i can read to you quotes from his lawyers and his teams that say he wants to use the enemy's alien act of 1798 to kick people out of the country and so many people will say no 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 he's not that crazy no yeah. no no it's what he's actually saying just please believe him when he tells you he's a monster yeah you know, mm -hmm. um, if we're not, if that isn't monstrous enough, Trump also plans to make v this is quote, OK, vast holding facilities that would function as staging centers for the people getting deported. Um, these would be focused initially on single adults because the government by law in the Flores settlement isn't allowed to hold children for long standing period without a court order. But the Trump administration is going to go to the Supreme Court through a long appeal process which is already they've been already pushing the supreme court to repeal the flores settlement and so their desire is to put all of these illegal immigrants family and children and all in massive camps and for them to be waited and for them to wait there kept in line before they can able to deport them without the proper um uh, legal appeals that has been given to them for the past i don't know how many decades it's just we're putting people in camps. Is that yeah. what we're doing? Yeah. So like when when I when we talk about illegal immigration a lot on the show, I always say like I don't want to go into a mass deportation campaign because I don't like the idea of some American Gestapo knocking down the doors of everyone's house looking for the undesirables, right? Mm. And people get mad that I say the word Gestapo because I'm invoking Nazi rhetoric. Well, listen, you're going to be talking about electing a guy who wants to put millions of people in camps, that's what we're going to do? No, it's important to use Nazi rhetoric when the behavior is comparable to what the Nazis did. Right. Because otherwise people are going to think that it's not as bad as what the Nazis did. And we need to make it very clear that this is terrible. This yeah. is this is how we get there, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 we have to be able to focus on step one and beat them there because it's going to be way harder to beat them at step 10, right? It's going to be way harder to start fighting the construction of the gas chambers than it is to fight the construction of the camps. Yeah. 
and they want us to to only start fighting at step 10. Yep, exactly. Yeah. They want like they they love that this would be laughed at by most people. Right. They were like, "Oh, you you guys are a bunch of just hypocritical liberals who are just scared." Dude, no we're not. I don't think we're hypocritical, but we are oh, fucking we are scared. scared. We are fucking scared. No doubt about yeah. that. And I said on the other one of our podcasts, man, fascism is going to come in the future with hearts and rainbows. Yeah. And I like that's what I feel like is happening right now. And it's dude. it's not even hearts and rainbows, but it's it's always there's always a blanket over it yeah is the thing this isn't like oh this is all happy-go-lucky but it's like it's not serious Mm -hmm. so it doesn't feel as sharp or threatening in the immediate term exactly yeah i will give props because part of the reason that we are talking about this right now is because off the back of a new york times article that talked about it yeah and they are giving all of this information so and they're obviously extremely mainstream media so i want to give them props for calling this out and not really pulling punches on talking about how extreme it is looking to be. No, for sure. The Washington Post had a good article too, showing how Trump's use of the word vermin for his political opponents is equal to that of what Mussolini was doing in the early part of his rise to power. Wow. So great article from the Washington Post too. Um, And so now you have, what he wants to do is deport millions of people and put millions of people in camps. That's going to take a lot of people. That's going to take a lot of manpower. How is he going to get this manpower? Well, Stephen Miller, his immigration advisor during the first year, during his first term in office, um, hopefully his last, but so far his first, um, he said that officials from other federal law enforcement agencies would be temporarily reassigned and that National Guard troops from different states and local police officers will become deputized to control immigration. That is insane and that is one area where local communities can fight back Mm -hmm. in local government you can write legislation that denies your police officers from operating with ice officials denies them from following through on illegal immigration checks Mm -hmm. you can write that type of legislation that is something you can do at the local level and i think it's super important that now that trump has the has even let's say he has a 10% 10% chance of coming back. We need to make it super clear that our communities will not cooperate. Yeah. We will not be complicit in this. We will not build any camps on our town's property, period. It's interesting. I remember listening maybe a week or two ago to an episode of The Daily um, by the, the Times that talked about that they went down to the border, I think in the town of Eagle Pass, Texas, and they interviewed a family who... The government had come to and they had asked if they could work with the family and work on their property to um, expel or to keep out illegal immigrants that were crossing into the border. And the family said yes, because there had been a time where immigrants had come over and were walking through their yard and the family was was scared because they didn't know who the people were and whether they might be dangerous or threatening. So the the family agrees and then they see the government, um, the, the officers or whatever, they come onto their lawn and they're putting, um, they're putting barriers up in their yard to prevent people from coming through. And they like raise this couple's garden or whatever, and they destroy their lawn. And the couple looks at the things that the officers are doing, and they say to the Times interviewer, like, "Oh, this was way too much. Like, this is not what I thought I was signing on for." Right. And I worry that something similar could happen here, right, where people are still uncomfortable with people coming across the border um like onto their property maybe with with some belongings or almost nothing like you don't know what they're going to be wearing or um look like and so it's it makes sense that people are going to be uncomfortable and because of that they're going to look to the government for help with that for more security but they won't be able to get out of it yeah. if the government oversteps. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, honestly, in that case scenario, that's a prime example of the government doing way more harm to that couple than any migrant was ever going to do. Oh, absolutely. Right? The yeah. government destroyed their property and all that when they were afraid of somebody else coming and destroying the property. Yeah, exactly. Which is, which is pretty classic. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's interesting about this with Trump wanting to use the National Guard is those are military personnel. Now, by law, military cannot act as law enforcement in the United States. That's Mm -hmm. one of the best things about our country. Um, Trump would use the Insurrection Act and plans on using the Insurrection Act on day one to use the military forces for law enforcement. He's also said this in in relation to local 
police, and local crime problems in San Francisco and New York. Tell me about the Insurrection Act. How does it work to allow military officers or forces to be used for law enforcement? So by saying that certain acts in a region of the country is a direct insurrection. Okay. You're allowed to use them. Yes, you're allowed to do that. Okay. Right. Even though it's so obviously not Well, then it gets challenged by the court. Sure. Right. And then you get challenged in the court and then it gets argued out. And the Supreme Court eventually will probably say no. Yeah. But in the meantime. But in the meantime. Now, in most laws, in the meantime, it doesn't take into effect. Mm. Example of this, Florida has passed a six-week abortion ban, but that is not in effect because it's in litigation in the Florida Supreme Court. It it goes by the different laws. I don't know how it works for the Insurrection Act. I'm not going to say I know if it happens in the meantime or not. Okay. But Trump's plan is to use the Insurrection Act day one to use military personnel to police the streets of the United States. Unreal. Okay. Unreal. So we're at the end. Yes. Of these are all the points. And at the end of all this, like, I just know, I truly believe that there are a good 40% of people in this country who won't feel like any of this is crazy. Right, they won't feel like any of it is too intense. They'll think the illegal immigrants are the problem, mm-hmm. and we need to go to whatever lengths we can to keep them out. So, first of all, to those people, I would say please find our episode where we do a deep dive on immigration and listen to what we say and listen to why it is actually a good thing for the country rather than a bad thing. But I think that would only cover maybe. 20, 25% yeah. of those deniers, right? So the real, the crux of the issue here is, is people have have decided that immigrants are the problem. Um, they've been told this for decades. Actually, for, for centuries, it's funny, I was reading up on the history of xenophobia in the United States, and one of the earliest examples was Benjamin Franklin worrying about Germans sure. coming over in yeah. large swaths, exactly. right? And swamping the population. Um Then they said the same thing about the Irish and the same thing about the Italians and the Integration Restriction League and all those people. So the question is, what what are you really afraid of, right? If you're afraid of crime, you can look at the data and see that crime actually isn't a problem and that immigrants commit crimes at lower rates than native-born Americans, okay? If it's... Um, if it's hurting the economy, that's not true. They tend to not compete with native born Americans for almost any jobs. And in fact, they just help the economy and thus drive everyone's wages up. The truth is there's, there's some vague idea that people are scared of losing the identity of the country. And I, I would just urge anyone to think about what exactly they are worried about, what exactly they have come to think that immigrants are causing and realize that, no, actually, having more people of more diverse backgrounds is exactly what made our country into what it is, what makes it wonderful, what makes our culture like really interesting and multifaceted and allows new ideas to come up and um, new kinds of art to be produced constantly so that we are gaining new perspectives and getting smarter and learning from each other. Yes. Um, You said something good about people being afraid of losing the identity of America. Yeah. And the identity of America is not its people. It is not a color, right? The identity of America is the belief that we are all, we are all um, just, we are all given inalienable rights Mm -hmm. and that we all have a place where we can live in freedom to pursue liberty and to pursue life. Yes. That is that is the identity of America. Yes. I mean, and and honestly, like integral to that is it's no matter where you come from. Yes. Right? That is what founded this country in the first place. Yes. Let's give us, stick give, to that. Give us your tired, your hungry, and your poor, as it says on the Statue of Liberty, please, because those people will be the hardest working and the most loyal to this country because we will give them the opportunity that they're craving that they're not getting from where they are right now. Yeah. And it's it's just so sad that we're talking about the we're talking about the flip side. Like we're talking about the opposite edge of this issue, where it's like, let's get rid of more of the immigrants rather than what we should be talking about is Why are we not letting more in? Why are we not making it easier for more of them to come in? Why do they have to come in illegally? Why can't we just make them come in legally? Yes. Like, I hate that the Overton window for this discussion is pushed so far towards the, 
we need to prevent more illegal immigration, that people are usually not even really considering immigration reform for more legal immigration. Now, I don't want to get into all of this. We can't. This, this is going to be such a long topic. But if you want to get into the United States legally and become a citizen legally as an unskilled laborer from any part of the Latin American world, okay, you have to apply. Basically, your only way to do it legally is to get in the diversity visa lottery and to get that lottery you put in your application and you have a one in 448 chance of getting selected every year and it's not even a wait list you just put your name into the hat and then every year you have a one out of 448 chance of getting selected that's our current system that's our current system so when they're hungry and they're impoverished and they have no opportunity in the middle of honduras and you tell them that you have a 100 440 you have a one in 448 chance of getting out of that country I would come here illegally. I would do whatever I can to get my child into America because yeah. I want them to have a better life. And you would do exactly the same. Amen. Right. Yeah. Amen. Let's move on. Now, we are back to the topic <laughs> that we seem to talk about the most on the show other than semiconductors. We are talking about- <laughs> Or immigration. Or immigration. Yeah. We're talking about a government shutdown <laughs> because of course we are because this country is fucking ungovernable. We're so broken. It's We're so bad. so broken. Um, Speaker Mike Johnson, our new kid on the block, the fresh face, um, he is tasked to do the impossible. He has to find a compromise to keep the government open by, I think it's Friday? So we have a couple days. Um, classic. Classic. So we have a couple days and it feels like, yeah, we got time. We got time. Yeah, <laughs> we're so used to being like, okay, we have exactly 16 hours and 32 minutes. All right, we'll, all right, we'll be okay. Yeah. Um, so... He needs to find a compromise to keep the government open. And obviously, this is going to be so difficult. This is the reason Kevin McCarthy was kicked out of his office, because the hard right flank did not like the way that he decided to do so. Well, um, Johnson is planning to do exactly the same thing Kevin McCarthy did. So Kevin McCarthy passed a 45-day clean um, CR, clean continuing resolution, um, with the help of Democrats, Mike Johnson's plan is to pass a clean CR with the help of Democrats. One thing that is different is he is splitting the CR into two separate bills, um, splitting the defense portion with like the farm bill and stuff, two mm -hmm. separate bills, um, which doesn't change much. I don't uh, think so. No. There are no spending cuts in either of the CRs, and the defense CR will be expiring on February 2nd. The CR that contains more of the domestic funding stuff expires a little bit um, uh, earlier in like late January. Mm -hmm. So Johnson has already conceded that we're not cutting anything right now. Cutting anything is totally off the table. It's impossible. Um, so conservatives and the House Freedom Caucus are obviously pissed. They have won one thing in this fight. It was actually their idea to split up the continuing resolution. That was the House Freedom Caucus's desired policy. So they got that. They also got the ability to pass these CRs well before Christmas. So that means that they won't be running up in front of the Christmas deadline, which I don't know why they want to do that so bad. If it's just them being selfish... I don't know. I'm pretty sure it is. That's disgusting. Yeah. Um, and so they're also happy that Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan aid are not in the CRs at all. Um, that'll be something totally different at some other point. Uh, so the House Freedom Caucus has already said they're not going to vote for it. Mm -hmm. The House Freedom Caucus has not endorsed it. The main leader in the House Freedom Caucus, the not the official leader who is Scott Perry, but like a real rhetoric leader of the House Freedom Caucus, Chip Roy, he's on the Rules Committee, and he said that my position to the clean CR just announced by the Speaker um, cannot be overstated. My opposition cannot be overstated. He said that funding Pelosi-level spending and policies for 75 days for future promises, that will not happen. So... Um, so we're just, I mean, we're just watching a rerun. We're, we're just watching we a rerun. This totally, is the same thing. Yeah. They, except that they're not going to kick Johnson off, out of his position because they, they're they tired. Yeah, they're and tired. they don't want to have to do the whole rigmarole again of no, finding a new speaker. They know that they're not going to kick Johnson out. Johnson knows he's not going to get kicked out. It's yeah. This is just what has to happen because the, the Republicans that now I think at least admit that they realize that they can't govern the country. Yeah, I think so too. And and they I want to point out how just absolutely silly this is that they've that they were pretending that like they 
it was the speaker who was leading them down this bad path and not the fact that they just have a tiny margin in the House and that they don't have the Senate and that they don't have the presidency. And the way that this works, and you can't change it, is that when you don't control those bodies and those positions, you can't just get everything you want. Right, what like, a shock! Yeah, it's it's how it works. And I thought you I thought you were taught this in kindergarten, guys. Chip yeah. Roy, what are you doing? I no. thought you were taught this when you were five years old that you can't always get everything you want. No, I mean, and and they he still kind of does get what he wants because he gets to say that he oppose it, opposes right. it. Right. <laughs> well, that's that's the real thing. I think these House Freedom Caucus guys just want to oppose it. Yeah, I don't think they want to cut anything. I think they love the high spending Pelosi levels because they get to keep ramaging on about how much they hate the Pelosi levels. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's what they want. So now the interesting fight here comes when they have to pass the rules package to get the bill onto the floor. Now, to pass the rules to pass the rules to begin debate on the bill, you have to have at least 217 votes. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in history, the opposing party does not vote for the parties in power rules package. Mm -hmm. The rules package is always passed with the party in power until this year. I couldn't even tell you the last time a rules vote failed, and now the rules vote failing is like no big deal because the Republican parties are so inept. Yeah. Um, we already have 20-something Republicans who have said that they're not going to be voting for the rules. Yeah. This level of, of normalcy, seeming normalcy, is just completely out the window. Yeah. I will note that there's a there's like a circumvention way to do this. I forget what it's called. There is. Um, but it's the way that McCarthy got the first continuing resolution that passed um, onto the floor because he also knew that the Republicans in the Rules Committee wouldn't let it get to the floor. Yeah. I think Johnson's going to do the same thing. Johnson has already said he's going to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. he, that's his plan. You need two-thirds of the House to do that. Okay. So it's I think it's called a rule sub su suspension or something. Um, and you can get around uh, accepting the rules before beginning debate. You need two-thirds of the House to do yeah. so. And I, I just can't emphasize enough how stupid and hypocritical this is that johnson is going to be using democrat help just as much as mccarthy he is going to be passing a bill that is just as pro-democrat and not pro-republican as mccarthy actually more because mccarthy's was 45 days this one's 75 yeah so so and and yet the republicans are, are just gonna let it slide because there is no principle no there's no here. ideology here no. they kicked out kevin mccarthy because they hate kevin mccarthy period yeah. there was nothing to it right totally and it's just pretending that there was something to it is stupid mm -hmm. so this gets us to our next topic because Ugh. here we go moody's has downgraded the u.s credit outlook they haven't downgraded our credit rating we are still triple a in the eyes of moody the highest possible credit score credit rating but they switched our outlook from stable to negative, and I wonder why, Ben. <laughs> I think I just think the idea, first of all, of a credit outlook is funny. It's like like we, <laughs> it's too soon yeah. to say anything about your rating, but you're on the fritz. Yeah, yeah, it's really funny. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this comes off the back when Fitch downgraded the U.S. credit rating. Yeah, um, and. So here we are. The Republicans um, have made the country fairly ungovernable, put us to the brink of shutdown multiple times, put us to when we almost went over the debt ceiling, unable to pay back our bills, right? Mm -hmm. So that obviously hurts our credit ratings. But mm -hmm. there's also some other things that do genuinely need to change about our fiscal policy mm -hmm. if we are to not have a credit downgrading. The truth is we do have a lot of debt. The truth is the rate in which our debt is growing is unacceptable. Our deficits are too big. Too much of our debt is too much of our annual deficit goes to interest payments. All of that can be true. Mm -hmm. But there's two ways to go about this. The Republican response is they want to cut 8% of federal spending across the board, which, as we all know, shrinks the overall economy. Mm -hmm. We know that that shrinks GDP. We know that. Um, Joe Biden issues has issues with the deficit as well and wants to shrink it through a different means. This is the Democrat way of shrinking it. They want to grow the economy through more government spending in some instances, and in some instances in cutting back, and tax higher earners to reduce our overall deficit. We can bring in, we can match what we bring in to what we spend out. Yeah, We need to b have a better tax system that is better at capturing money from the highest earners. And a lot of these problems, they won't go away. 
but they'll start to be dealt with. Yeah, and there are ways that we have already seen the Biden administration doing this. We just, on our last episode, talked about huge quarter three GDP growth that the U.S. had, 4.9% rate in the last quarter, which is going to help a lot in terms of the tax revenue that we're going to be bringing in. Um, Biden passed a 15% corporate minimum tax in the U.S., which is going to be great because there are some enormous companies that, with the use of tax credits and other loopholes, have avoided paying any taxes on their profits um, in the U.S. for a long time. I know Nike is one of those companies. Uh, and so there are ways to do this. He, in, in the budget that Biden proposed earlier this spring, which unfortunately without having a Democrat-controlled Senate and House isn't going to go anywhere, but he proposed raising the marginal tax rate, the top marginal tax rate, which right now is 37%, the lowest it's been in, I think, 100 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that that rate used to be up at 80, 90% back 95 when- 95% under Dwight Eisenhower. Yes, back when we had compressed wages and not enormous inequality. We can, if we ratchet that rate back up, not only are we likely, certainly going to be collecting more taxes from the individuals at the top, but our economy is going to be spurned into more growth because that's the effect of reducing inequality. Yeah. Once you have more money closer to the bottom end, it's circulating more often. Yes. And we see that right now, actually. I, if I can get to that. I have a chart at the very bottom of the page, Ben. Mm. We can see that when we look at uh, the top of page 11. So when we look at the last couple, the last year of wage growth, the bottom 10% of wage earners have seen record wage growth, record wage growth. The the 50%, the 50th percentile of wage earners basically have the same wages from 2020. But when you look at the bottom 10% of wage earners, their wages have almost gone up by almost 10% wow. over the last year. Yeah. That is an awesome sign of the bottom being brought up into the middle class. And that's a lot because of Biden's agenda. I also want to talk about other ways Joe Biden has been working on raising revenues. Mm -hmm. He put on a 1% stock buyback tax on all companies through the Inflation Reduction Act. He says if reelected, he wants to raise that from 1% to 4%, huge. which is huge because so much of our money gets financialized. And instead of going into real assets, goes into the financial money trading game. Yep. And if we can push corporations to take more of their excess profits and invest it back into real material yep. rather than make it into just financial gains like that, that grows the economy, boosting our revenue. So again, this is the different philosophies on how to tackle our debt, how to tackle our debt crisis. Mm -hmm. um, we are also having trouble with our debt right now because interest rates are going so high. Moody says that because of higher interest rates, without effective fiscal policy measures to reduce government spending or increase revenues, Moody's expects the U.S. financial deficits to remain very large, significant weakening the debt affordability. What does debt affordability mean? Debt affordability means how much of our annual spending goes towards interest. This is a very important thing to recognize. When we spend a lot of our money yearly on interest payments, that leaves us less money to pay for better social services, better business investment. So right now, I want to bring our attention to talking about how much of our annual deficit, uh, how much of our annual spending is spent on just our interest payments. Now, we are approaching a record high. We are currently spending about 10% every year on our interest payments. By 2035, we're expecting to get to 18% if nothing changes. This will be surpassing the height of American interest payments, which was 1995. We were spending 15% every year of our government spending was just on interest alone. Something has to change. Why was that? I'm like tangent, but in the nineties. I couldn't tell. Right. You. It feels it feels like the nineties were such a relatively calm time for us post Cold War, right? Less a lot less reason to be spending. Well, it, it spiked at nineteen eighty. Okay. Oh, I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> Did it have something <laughs> to do mind. with Ronald Reagan destroying our tax base yep. and tripling our deficit for the first time ever as a president? Yeah. Maybe it had something to do with that. Probably. Maybe maybe, Probably. Have, maybe it had something to do with Ronald Reagan's incredible deficit spending that took a decade to fix. Yeah. Maybe that. 
Wow. Um, Man, Clinton was really just wrenching that shit down. Clinton did. Clinton was the last president to have a surplus. No yeah. deficit at all, right? Yeah. So there we go. That's what Moody's is saying. Janet Yellen obviously does not agree with this downgrade. Obviously. Obviously, she's going to say that. Yeah, of course. Um, and she does not like that this is coming at this specific time. And we'll talk about that. Yeah. So on top of all this terrible news about our debt, on top of all the terrible news <clears throat> about the government not functioning and Republicans not being able to keep the government open on their own, the bond market is also taking a massive hit. So we had a bond sell-off recently. Now, this is when all the traders go to the Treasury. The Treasury sells off a bunch of bonds, and they have bidding stuff about how much you're going to pay for the bonds, and the market determines the price of these bonds. Mm -hmm. Well, the 30-year bond rate auction topped at a yield high of 4.77%. Now, I'm not an expert on the bond market, but what this means to me is their interest rate for these bonds went up so high because the demand to buy the bonds were so low, they had to encourage investors to buy these bonds, right? Yep. So um, the bid-to-cover ratio... The dollar amount of bids received, so the dollar cover ratio is one metric that we have to look at if we are to understand the demand of bonds, right? So what is a bid to cover ratio? That is the dollar amount of bids received in a treasury security auction versus the amount sold. And this is a good gauge of demand. And it fell down to 2.24 from the 2.35 number of October and the average of 2.39. So we're well below average. We're going in a very, very poor direction from last month. And this is making our debt more and more expensive. Yeah. This is increasing our interest rate. We just talked about 10% of our current federal spending every year, maybe 12% or something like that, goes specifically to interest. When we have poor bond selling like this, that means that that interest rate goes up and up and up on our debt faster and faster and faster. Yes. God. Yeah. Exactly. It's, uh, it's a nightmare, dude. Yeah. It's and it all, it, it all goes together. Like It's a very cohesive story, right? Poor ability to govern massive deficits that have been the case for several years no political interest or will to raise taxes none specifically on the republican side and i, I will say that because democrats are so willing to raise taxes on the rich oh yeah right and republicans are there the problem is that their unwillingness to raise taxes extends to the rich right so because of that, we are we are lacking in our main method, our main mechanism for collecting revenue, and we're not making any progress on the debts that we have. Yeah. We're just paying off interest, and we're continuing to borrow. Like We're in this clear negative spiral where since we're running at such big deficits, we need to borrow more now to pay the interest of the debts that we already hold, and so we're necessarily creating larger and larger debts, right, that have higher and higher interest rates. Yes. And we are currently sitting at a debt to GDP ratio of 122%, which is basically what we were at during World War II. 122% is nothing to be like, oh my God, sound the alarm, buzz, 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 freak out. We don't need to be there yet, but we're going to get there really, really fucking fast if we don't have if we don't have adults sit down and figure out how to fix that, fix the fiscal situation of the country immediately. Yeah. And it cannot be from hurting the most vulnerable among us. That's not a serious solution. Mm -hmm. It's not a serious solution to look at the country and say, okay, how can we balance the budget? Okay, take the food stamps away from the grandma. Maybe that that's not the way to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be on board for anything like that. So Janet Yellen is obviously not happy about this timing of the Moody's downgrade and for very, very good reason. Xi Jinping is coming to the United States to meet with leaders across Asia and President Biden himself. Now, there are a lot of political intentions to this meeting and business intentions for China coming yeah. to the United States. Yeah. We'll start with the political. So first things first, the Taiwan elections are coming up soon, January 15th. I want to do a whole topic just about the Taiwan elections next week. Sure. We could go down the different political parties and learn the political system. Okay. Because um, those elections are going to be very important for the future of Taiwan and for the future of um, Asian stability. <clears throat> Um, the United States also wants to understand China's role in the Israeli and Ukrainian wars. That is Biden's basically top priority. Um, the Taiwan elections being in early January are very, very important. 
We know that China is suffering. They do not have the best economic growth numbers that they would like to have. We know that their population is currently in decline. We know they have the massive debt crisis. We know they have a real estate crisis. They have a lot of issues. If they want to do an action, if they want to do something big, they really have to do it with now or in the next few years. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of a better justification that they could have than if Taiwan elects a pro-independence party and then they decide that is a reason to do a violent reunification. Yep. And military um, commentators say that late March, early April is the best, best time weather-wise for a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. So that's very interesting timing. You have the election in January, February, end of March, they could launch the invasion. So this is really one of those crunch times where we need to figure out what the hell is going on. And they could even, they could be playing chess on a different level where they're thinking, okay, if we know that March and April is the best time to invade, then so will the U.S. and they'll be most ready then. So they could be incentivized to invade even earlier than that. Yes. So we need to be, this is the biggest t conversation that has to be had right yes, now. Yes. Super on our toes. Yes. Yeah. And America needs to get more money to Taiwan. Apparently, we've been funding Taiwan to the teeth right now. Yeah. As far so as much. we've been arming them like crazy. Like apparently. crazy. And we need more <clears throat> of it. Taiwan needs more of it. They need to be able to deter China. Yeah. Um, it has to happen. So it's just insane to think about. Um, China is also going into this, um, and the American counterparts as well. They really want to work on economic ties. It is not in the interest of China, and it is not in the direct interest of the United States to make the other feel that they're decoupling. Mm -hmm. America wants to very softly, very calmly, very non-aggressively, right? They don't want it to be like bad blood decoupling. Yeah. Well, the terminology is always de-risk rather than decouple. I mm. think she the other day said something along the lines of um, America and China have no greater interest than bettering the relationship between America and China. Yes. Um, which is potentially valid. And even as I read about these um, events that might be taking place, I think, man, it would just be so much better if we could if we could find a way to bring them into our coalition oh, yeah, dude, rather man. than to other china but we've we tried we tried for decades yeah. to do that and it didn't work and the ccp just held on to their power and kept lying in wait trying to find a time to strike yes so we I, just we can't trust them and it might be now yeah it's just, it's all about if they invade Taiwan, when and where, because they 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 say openly that unification is in the future, right? Yeah, I mean they say that, so it's all about that. Yeah. Um, but I, I want let's do a little recap of China's current economic situation. So they had four point nine percent quarter three GDP growth, which is very good for a uh, an advanced country for an advanced country advanced economy, right? Yeah. Um, but the issue is China isn't technically a totally advanced economy. It's technically a developing country. Mm -hmm. And their overall yearly goal is 5%, which is the lowest yearly goal that they've ever had on record. So a 5% growth equal to that of the United States in quarter three is not acceptable for China's political system at all. Yeah. Um, and this is directly caused by their decline in exports. So in the month of October, we saw a 6.4% decline in exports over the previous of the year. There is some good news in these numbers. China saw a 3% growth in imports, which as we've talked about in the past, if you keep up with us, imports are a direct leading indicator of future exports in China because China is a manufacturing hub. So what they import is going to be input materials mm -hmm. to build things to then export. Yeah. So the fact that they have a 3% growth in imports over the last year means that we could maybe see a growing exports in the month of November and December. But we'll have to wait and see. We don't know if that's the case. There's been flukes of import growth in the past that haven't panned out for the Chinese. So we just have to wait. But mm -hmm. that's where China's at. They're not really happy with how they're doing. Um, China's share of U.S. imports has fallen to the lowest since 2006. Yeah. Now, you, Chinese imports make up only about 12 to 13 percent of America's exports, uh, America's imports. That is from the peak of 22 percent in uh, 2016. So we have there is decoupling happening, whether you like it or not. Yeah. It's what's going on. If you don't like the word, you don't like the word, G, but it's what's happening. Um, and there's even a greater bipartisan push to decouple and de 
um, integrate our economies, right? Yeah. There Isolate is, on the vehicle front. Definitely on the vehicle front. We've done a whole thing about electric vehicles and how China is just whooping our ass. Destroying. Destroying the world. Yeah. Including I'm, us. Do, yeah, because they have they have access to all, basically all, the raw materials they need. Yep. They already have the manufacturing capabilities built out where U.S. has to build it all from scratch. Yeah, and they made this bet over two decades ago. So they've been working in this direction and only now is kind of the world catching up and investing fully into the EV transition. Exactly. America just has to do so much initial investment that China doesn't have to do over the next 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. So American uh, legislatures, bipartisanly, Republicans and Democrats, specifically from Michigan, which makes sense, um, mm -hmm. want to boost the tariffs on Chinese vehicles. Right now, there's a 25% tariff on Chinese vehicles. They want to raise it even more. That 25% tariff was put in during the Trump administration and extended by the Biden administration. So for all the areas where Trump and Biden disagree, this is one area where everyone agrees we're not buying Chinese cars. Do you? I don't know. I disagree. I, you don't agree with this policy? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, because I get to sit here and not worry about the the GDP of Michigan. And I, I get to worry more about the world's progress against climate change. Right. Right? Right. This is slowing all of our progress down against climate change. Actively. No doubt. Actively doing that. And that, like, I don't know. It's Maybe it's less politically viable, but it's certainly not the right decision in my mind. No. I, I Listen, I understand where you're coming from. I think... I'm okay with I'm I'm I lean more towards a freer ish trade, especially when it comes to finished commodities. I don't like I'm 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 not okay with tariffs when it's about input goods. We've talked about yeah. Trump's aluminum tariffs before, and I don't agree with taxing aluminum across the border because that's an input, right? Mm -hmm. Our manufacturers need that to produce goods. Yeah. Well, see, to me, it's almost like I'm I'm down for either whether it's export restrictions for us, I'm down with restricting trade when national security is involved. Mm -hmm. This seems like we're restricting trade in a way that hurts our national security and what, in fact, is global security in not accelerating towards a green economy faster. Yes. That's I, how I feel about it. No, and I understand where you're coming from. It just depends... It's hard for me because it just – do we want China to be the industry leader? You're basically saying they already are. Well, they definitely already are. Yes. Right now. And I, I understand the the argument like we want a foot in that industry as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we can get it without these tariffs. You think so? Like because we're still early on in this transition, right? That's fair. There's still – the vast majority of cars on the road are still – um, internal combustion engine cars. So there's a long ways to go. There's a huge market that still mostly hasn't been captured. It's going to be growing. And the Inflation Reduction Act now has all these incentives for specifically American companies and American-made cars That's true. to get onto the road. That's so true. yeah, I think they're going to grow. I think American cars will still be, even without these tariffs, would be more popular than Chinese I agree. cars like down the road. Um, it's just a small sacrifice to make. Yeah. No, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. But that is one of the things that's going on right now. There's a bipartisan... Basically, the end of the story is there's a bipartisan consensus to fuck China. Yes. Right? That's 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 the truth. That's probably the, the most obvious thing that the Democrats and Republicans can agree on right yes, now. Yes, very true. Um, China's ambassador to the United States, Xi Feng, said in a video recently... Um, that he wants reassurance that the United States does not seek to change China's system mm -hmm. and does not seek a new Cold War, does not support Taiwan independence, yep. and has no intention to seek decoupling from China. That is what the United, the Chinese ambassador to the U.S., Xi Feng, wants to see from this meeting. Um, it looks like all of those things are not going to be met. <laughs> <laughs> I think he'll get, I actually think he will get all of those assurances. Uh, from the Biden administration? Yeah. I think the administration will say all those things. Oh, yeah. I've seen speculation I think it's even all lies, though. that they'll reaffirm like the one China policy. Wow. You think um, they'll reaffirm one China in there? I think so. Because I, I think that's the most important thing to China. I think Biden will make the calculation that it's more important to smooth things out right now, even if it is a lie. Okay. Because he won't have to really act on it unless China invades. Yeah, but 
does it make it more likely for China to invade if they don't think the U.S. will do it? Mm. Mm. Right? If you go into his face and you say, I'm going to defend Taiwan, dude. Like, I gave them a lot of money. They're integral to our economy. I'm going to defend Taiwan if you invade them unilaterally. I'm going to do that. Maybe. Does that they make them say, okay, then we can't invade because that would end the world? Or does that make them say, like, what does that make them say? Or does that make them say we have to invade faster before the u.s can up the defenses yeah it's so complicated and way beyond our pay grade that's mm-hmm. just what's going on um now with xi in regards to their business leaders right so xi is also having a problem you talked very interestingly about apple i think yeah yeah so apple is pulling out a lot of its manufacturing from china yeah and well foxconn specifically is the manufacturer of the iphone for apple and the chinese government what two three weeks ago announced or it was reported that they're cracking down and they're doing like internal audits on Foxconn and looking at land use regulations and whether they've been violated by Foxconn. Basically, um, this, what was it in response to? It was in response to the semiconductor. Yeah. 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 Um, the new semiconductor regulation. So they were like, you're going to slap regulations on us, slap export controls on semiconductor technology. We're going to crack down on one of the biggest, gdp producing american companies in the world right so now that has scared a lot of american manufacturers to take up root in china yeah so now in response china wants to make it very easy for these business leaders to come in they are business leaders can spend two thousand dollars to dine with all the leaders or forty thousand dollars companies can purchase eight seats at a table plus one seat at mr xi's table himself for forty thousand dollars, insane. It is actually insane, dude. We should pool all of our money together, get forty thousand bucks, and go shit at, sit at a table with G. <laughs> How cool would that be? That would be crazy. Um, a survey done by the uh, U.S. China Business Council um, found that thirty four percent of its members have stopped or plan to reduce investment in China over the last year. Um, which is a higher percentage than in all previous years they've done the survey. So there is definitely a feeling that private manufacturers do not want to participate in the Chinese economy anymore. That is not due to technically due to U.S. policy. There's no U.S. U.S. policy might be informing that decision, but there isn't a U.S. policy saying manufacturers can't go to China. Mm -hmm. The manufacturers are choosing not to go to China because of the geopolitical realities. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I think the people or the companies that have already invested there, they want to be able to stay they want to be able to make good on their plant investments but they're scared to and so now they're they feel incentivized to move out oh easily yeah Yeah. and now the main thing that china is going to plead to the united states they're going to get on their knees and beg they want the u.s to ease up on their semiconductor restrictions president biden do not ease up on your semiconductor restrictions the fact that they're that they're asking this of you and they're making it public that they're asking this means that it's working Right, they would not be embarrassing themselves by asking for this pullback of restrictions if they don't feel it in their environment. I don't. Th- oh, oh, okay. Yes, it yeah. means the restrictions are working. Yes, yes, absolutely. So we need those restrictions to stay in place. <clears throat> Do not let them get away with trying to get otherwise. Although they also would be incentivized to make the Biden administration think that they were working really, really well, even if they weren't. God, dude, you're right. Why is everything so fucking complicated? Yeah, there are many, there are a lot of moves to be made, but I do, I do think they're working nevertheless. Yeah, I do think they're working. We talked about how there's like some slip through the cracks, maybe, maybe it's some way because of their new phone that they recently developed through Huawei. Yeah. But I don't think that we, we talked about that. We don't think it's sustainable. Yeah, we don't think it's sustainable. They don't have the manufacturing uh, capabilities to fix the equipment if it breaks mm-hmm. or service the equipment yearly or anything like that and they probably used stashed chips for years that they had collected as they were waiting for these restrictions to go into place yeah exactly um let's stick on geopolitics for a second so staying on the geopolitics the united states has responded to iranian-backed proxies that have attacked u.s troops in syria mm-hmm. now we talked about this last week and we had a little conversation about whether the u.s should respond or not respond mm-hmm. um to summarize the u.s has 2,500 troops based in iraq and 900 troops based in syria in part of an enduring mission to prevent a resurgence of the islamic state mm-hmm. um You don't really hear about ISIS anymore. They still exist. Technically, they're a ragtag group of guys that are still around doing their thing. Hating the West. Hating the West, wanting to destroy the world um, and make a global Islamic caliphate. There are about 3,000 troops in the Middle East right now um, pushing them down as much as they can. Um, 
Iranian proxies have bombed these U.S. troops. U.S. troops have suffered brain damage. None of them have died, but some of them have traumatic brain injuries. And we talked about whether or not the U.S. should respond. I leaned on they should mm -hmm. because Iran needs to know that their proxies need to be kept in line on a short leash and not be able to do that. You feared that it would increase tensions mm -hmm. and make worse on the global situation, which I don't really disagree with that just escalate the situation generally right, right. Yeah. there is just a just an escalation yeah um but i i'll say openly i don't know what exact routes of diplomacy might be taken mm -hmm. to reduce this yes exactly right? right and i don't know like it's 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 scary to think about using diplomatic means with isis Oh, right, yeah. like to give them any sort of leash mm -hmm. to treat them like anything but terrorists, mm -hmm. that seems wrong as well. No, so. I know it's it's a hard call, but the United States has made the call. The Department of Defense has shot at least two Ira uh, Iranian proxy positions. I have seen reports that it's now three as of one hour ago, mm -hmm. but I can only confirm two. Um, one of them was a training location that was actually used by um, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is the Iranian military. Um, as we know so far, no Iranian troops have been killed. The other one was a weapons stash facility that we destroyed. Um, uh, rep not representative, Defense Secretary Lloyd, uh, General Lloyd Austin said that we won't hesitate to take further necessary measures to protect our people and to do so at a time and place of our choosing. So we are going in strong against Iran. There is no mincing words happening right now. We are intensely opposing any type of proxy attacks on our troops. Um, these militant group troops have attacked 50, 50 position, or they have done 50 attacks since October 7th, um, which is just insane. Yeah. We now have the, youth, the Houthis in Yemen, which have shot down a drone over the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. So they're getting more agitated and more directly antagonistic with the U.S. Mm -hmm. And this calls me into question. This, this, this raises a larger question. Does Iran have control of their proxies anymore? Mm -hmm. Did did the proxies outgrow the Iranian leash? And hmm. I don't know if Iran can rein them in. I, I wonder because me I, I wonder if Iran is looking at the situation in Israel and Gaza right now and thinking tensions are high and they're maybe they have an eye on the political situation in the US. They see how many people are upset with the with the killing of tens of thousands of Gazan citizens. And they're saying, look, the U.S. can't really politically afford, and they don't want to escalate the situation, right, any anymore. No. They want to de-escalate the situation. So we can, they think maybe that they can take more from the U.S. They can gain more ground, even just in terms of, shooting down drones, right. attacking facilities in Iraq, right. then they might lose by doing so. Oh, totally. Totally. They have a huge incentive to keep doing what they're doing, operating in this gray zone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... But I, like, Iran does not want full-out war with the United States. They are not in a position to win that war. Mm -mm. They are in a position to only suffer from that war. Um, and they're definitely in fear that their influence in the Middle East, their Shia influence, right, to combat the Sunni influence of Saudi Arabia would weaken dramatically mm. if they were to get into a war with the United States and lose a lot of their military and economic power. Yeah, okay. So they're, they're, they want to keep this Cold War cold. They have no desire to wreck their position, I think, because yeah. they know they would lose. It does make me think, again, are there what other avenues, what other routes does the U.S. have of exerting some of their power in the region? Can they can they block certain types of goods from entering or leaving these countries? Not mm -hmm. life-giving goods like oil and food, right? But um, but other things that they might produce, I don't know the politics or the the economics of the region well enough mm -hmm. um but i do know that the u.s has a powerful navy that they could use for yeah. those means so the u.s guys. the u.s is upping their sh their sanctions on um the palestinian islamic jihad they are limiting the ability for these these groups to transfer money from iran into gaza mm. and 
sanction a Lebanese money exchange services that has been found to facilitate the transfers of Iran to Palestinian military terrorist groups in Gaza itself. So that is the now step they're taking. This is the third sanction that they've put on them since October 7th. I can't tell you the first two, but this is what I've read. This is the most powerful. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely cutting off the a lot of the Gazan um, military funding apparatus from Iran. This is something I, I'd say I'm in support of. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, right? Like, the, if if you're a, a liberal who's upset about the treatment of the Palestinians and of the Gazans by Israel and the West and the U.S. being complicit in that, this is exactly the right way yeah. for them to fight against Hamas and the associated groups. Because what this does, this fights against Hamas. This doesn't fight against Palestinians. Yep. This fights against Hamas, mm -hmm. who is the enemy. The Palestinian people are lovely they are our brothers and sisters just like any other race and any other people in any other part of the world mm -hmm. hamas are the bad guys they got to be stopped and this is a good way to do that it's a good way to pick and choose the enemies here totally totally all right now i want to talk about some climate change related stuff baby Hooray. i know and it's actually good news we were talking about this earlier on in the day and I'm kind of bullish on this. Yeah, you you are bullish. I'm happy about it. That's it's exciting. A, it's a it's a nice feeling. Um, a commercial plant is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. It is a private company called Heirloom Carbon Technologies, based out of California, and it is calling itself the first commercial plant in the U.S. to use direct air capture. Now, what is direct air capture? Well, it involves sucking greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and storing it um, either underground inside of concrete, uh, you know, keeping it away from making the global temperatures rise. Mm -hmm. So the way that um, Heirloom is doing their process here is they're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and they're trapping it in concrete, which is such a cool idea that I love so much because then this could be used as building technology. This could be used for roads. This could be used for a bunch of other stuff. True. Um, the way that the whole process works, I'll run down it quick because I think the I think the technology is actually very, very cool. Mm. Um, so it utilizes limestone. This is one of the most abundant rocks on the planet. And it forms when calcium oxide binds with carbon dioxide. Now, that's important. In nature, that process takes years. But heirloom is able, able to speed it up very, very fast. They heat limestone to 100 one to 1650 degrees fahrenheit in a massive kiln which is powered already by renewable energy the carbon dioxide then comes out of the limestone and is pumped inside of a storage tank so you're separating that calcium oxide and that carbon dioxide you're making the carbon dioxide a gas pulling it out all you have left is the calcium dioxide that leftover calcium dioxide it's thin it looks like flour and it is doused with water and spread onto large trays which are carried already by robots onto large tower racks and exposed to open air over three days the white powder absorbs all the carbon dioxide in the air and turns into limestone once again where it goes back in the kiln the carbon dioxide goes back into the storage container and then the cycle repeats over and over and over and over again heirloom works with another company called carbon cure which mixes this carbon dioxide into concrete which is amazing because now future projects um can be used future construction projects can use this concrete instead of making new concrete leveling our carbon footprint um and in the future heirloom plans on pumping the carbon dioxide into massive underground storage wells um and burying it instead of just moving it into a new um concrete product which is just like are we in the future or what, dude? Yeah, that's super cool. It's exciting to me, too, that they, they're going to create concrete, which means they can sell concrete, which means this can be economically viable in the market on its own. Yes, right? just on its own. Where governments are not the only buyer. Yes. That's huge to me. There are other buyers of this as well that go outside of the commodity production aspect. Mm -hmm. um, Microsoft has signed on to a massive deal. What does Microsoft have to do with carbon capture? Well, the company makes its money, the heirloom makes its money by selling carbon removal credits to companies who purchase them to offset their own emissions. Yeah. So Microsoft has signed a deal to remove 315,000 tons of CO2 from the atmosphere 
with this company, Heirloom. Um, Microsoft said carbon removal can be a lot more expensive than offsets, but what you're paying for in terms of climate impact is radically different. Totally. So we see Microsoft, this private company, making really good inroads. Yeah. Well, what I think about when I hear this is this needs to be paired with a cap and trade legislation, right? A cap and trade policy, which means that the government sets a cap on the amount of CO2 emissions that can be um, that can be had each year kind of across the board. And it gives out credits or tokens or something to trade. You can trade um, the representative item that says how many emissions that you can produce. So I feel like what you need is a cap and trade policy, which is going to force the scaling up of this system in the economy yep. naturally. Naturally. Because now what happens is these guys could earn cap tokens mm -hmm. and then trade them. Exactly. So that's exactly what has to happen. Yes. And then you can slowly taper down the amount of carbon you are allowed to produce in the whole economy. Yes. So currently the company uh, only has the capacity to suck out 1,000 tons a year, which sucks. Yeah. That's only equal to about 200 cars, which is nothing. really nothing. No. But the Biden administration has awarded $1.2 billion to help several companies, including Heirloom, build larger plants that are going to produ produce this repeat this process in massive scales in Texas and Louisiana, specifically the company's Airbus planes and chase <clears throat> big bank are in the market of purchasing these credits to reach their climate goals so heirloom has massive potential buyers if they're able to upscale yeah but i mean you have here there's backlash to the technology because people think that it will be used just as a justification for why we can keep burning fossil fuels and i completely understand that and that's why i think instituting cap and trade is it's necessary mm -hmm. for this to work sure right without it, it and we've we've talked about this before Producing more clean energy um, is is kind of just a fun, exciting stat to look at that could possibly mean absolutely nothing as far as what we're doing to transition to a green economy. Yeah. Because what matters is the raw amount of fossil or of greenhouse gases in the air. Yeah. That is what is warming the earth. So if we're producing a ton of green energy and we're also burning a ton of oil and a ton of natural gas to create energy we're still fucked. Right. It doesn't help us at all. Exactly. So we need it to not just be like, oh, we can capture a lot of carbon so that we can burn a lot more carbon. That doesn't do anything for us. Right. And a lot of heirlooms policy or like um, their goals is to specifically, they specifically say they want to undo the damage of the industrial revolution. They want to, they, they, their dream is to suck the carbon out of the atmosphere that's been there since 1890. Yeah. Right. That's like their go-to phrase there. And I really like that about them. Yeah, that's exciting because the other company, the other major company, and we talked about this before, that is getting funding yeah. for this direct air capture is called Occidental Petroleum. I read about these guys, man. What yeah. a bunch of bastards. It's terrible. And I mean, they what they're doing is exactly what I just described, right? Yeah. They're just... They're ready to produce more oil and they're, they've bought up smaller carbon capture companies um, so that they can try to scale them up to allow Occidental Petroleum to produce and sell more petroleum. Yep. It's disgusting. The executives of that company have actually been on the record and said in their earning calls that this tech will save our industry. So that, that's their goal here. We can't let them do that. No. Um, one downside about this carbon capture technology, right? It's very expensive right now. It's $600 every ton to remove. That's a lot of money. Um, it's the actually the most expensive way to curb emissions. Um, but people say, and I agree, that when you upscale this and you get this going, it becomes cheaper and cheaper per ton. And I definitely think over the next three years, this could be something we could see in the future that becomes par and parcel of our industrial economy. I hope so. And it is exciting that limestone is like the basic material, Just which so is so abundant. common. The other nice thing, the optimistic thing I'll say about prices, some of Heirloom's first sales for capture and storage in 2021 for two thousand dollars a ton, so we're talking about two years ago, the price down from two thousand to six hundred. Wow! So six hundred might sound like a lot, but we've talked before when we did our climate change deep dives about the basically the learning curve as far as how much cheaper a technology gets the more it's used. It seems like this learning curve might be extremely steep, kind yeah. of the level that we need it to be. I'm gonna be honest. When I read that tech and I read the science behind this, and I could totally understand it, and yeah. I know nothing about science, I was like. That's all it is? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. That's all it is? That's the whole process? Yeah. 
that seems so easy. It, it seems so simple. It does seem easy. It, it does seem good. I, I, but I still think it needs more money to Obviously, scale, right? It's course. only got a few billion from the government. I, I'm. It's, Once it's they fun. have, if they get money up front from Chase, Airbus, Microsoft, that can definitely help them. But yes. now I want to go into a story that talks about the real dangers of climate change that are affecting your pocketbooks right now. Mm -hmm. um, house insurance is going through the roof, specifically in Florida. But over the course of the United States, house insurance rates nationwide have jumped 19% over the last five years. That's above the average increases of, the, of inflation, right? You're supposed to only see 2% increases. If we factor in everything else, this is still above where inflation was generally. Oh, wait, is it? I don't know. I actually don't know. I don't if know. 19% in five years with okay, the spike wait. that we had. It might be like two below or two above. It's around there. Mm. All right. I, it would be too much. to. Maybe you could do it. I'm trying know. to find. If you can interrupt me. But. I can only find like per year. So it's hard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So point is, it's growing very fast. 19% is fast. Many Floridians, though, have seen it go up 40% over the last year. In one year, yeah, house insurance has gone up 40%. Insur insurance agents communicating with West, with West Palm Beach residents who have actually seen their premiums totally double, right? Really quick. Really I, quick. I calculated it. Oh, yeah? It's actually less than inflation. Is it really? Yeah. Inflation since 2018 is 24%. Okay. So what that tells me is Florida is getting absolutely more royally fucked than everybody else. Correct. So, okay, Florida is getting hammered by this. Mm -hmm. And insurance <clears throat> agents don't know what to do. They are getting calls from residents in West Palm Beach that are like, okay, my wind insurance premium was 10000 last year. Right, this year, it's 20000 What's going on? The insurance agents has told them, don't renew your insurance. And the best you can do is self-insure. What does self-insure mean? That means there's no insurance. That means you put your money in a savings account and you hope you don't have to use it. That's what the health ins that's what these house insurance companies are actually saying to their re to their customers. That's so crazy. So now homeowners insurance in Florida are facing house uh, house insurance prices that are three and a half times the national average. Wow. How, uh, housing is already a problem in Florida because they have restrictions on building. Building is becoming more expensive there. Mm. This is one of the many reasons. Um, and now we're having this house insurance spike. It's going to be insane. So there has been some legislative response, which has proven to be ineffective. To lower the cost of, of house insurance premiums, Florida legislatures and Governor Ron DeSantis have recently passed a bill that limited the amount of litigations that insurance customers were allowed to bring against their insurance companies. Because the insurance company said one of the reasons that we have to raise our prices so much is because we're suffering so much litigation. That's crazy. Well, guess what, guys? The number of insurance-related litigation have decreased, but premiums have not, and neither has the rate of growth of premiums. Of course not. Of course not. No. These insurance companies got Governor DeSantis by the balls. <laughs> yes, they did. Fucking Ronald Meatball Ron <laughs> has his meatballs it's cupped <laughs> by these fucking insurance companies. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, of, of, of course they're not decreasing the rates. Like, obviously. Oh, right? we, uh, this we, is exact. Like, I can just imagine the... The boardroom or the executives in in a company thinking like how can we how can we get the government to help us how can we get the government to raise our profits we'll say that we need the money to pay for that we don't have the money to pay for these litigations and then we'll just use the money and pocket it it's so good yeah it's so dude this is probably the best investment these companies could have ever made yeah that, that was that that's more return than any investment in any type of business they could have done, right? Totally. So it's just insane to me. And it reminds me when we read the book Supreme Inequality by Adam Cohen, where we talked about a lot of these different Supreme Court cases that kind of made modern America, there was a part of it that was all about tort reform. And there was a big push to make it harder and harder for consumers to sue the businesses that sell them bad products. Yes. And that's exactly what Ron DeSantis just did, and we saw no benefit. Yeah. Um, wow. And now, at a certain point... People are suggesting that private insurers will just stop operating in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. There's no incentive. It's too expensive. It's too expensive. There's too much payouts because hurricanes come by too often. The weather is getting too bad. There are too there is too much of a risk of water levels rising and destroying the city of Miami. So there just will be no incentive. And then 
a federal program is going to have to step in and insure these homeowners, which is just going to cost us more money. So it's very, very ironic to me that a government in Florida, which has a total Republican control, mm -hmm. is doing nothing to combat climate change. The residents are seeing some of the most direct effects in their pocketbook with a decreased standard of living immediately. And that now the federal government has to go and bail them out. That's crazy. I, I'm as I hear, hear you say this, I'm like, please don't bail them out, federal government. Please. <laughs> well, what are we gonna do? We're gonna let these people lose their homes and not get reimbursed. What about the state? Yeah, but the state doesn't have the money to do that. Uh, like, what are we gonna do here? The, the, neither does the federal government. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, and, they, and they don't want to do anything about climate change. If it was a state that was actively making <clears throat> steps to do more climate legislation, mm. to really invest in climate stuff. I would be totally different, dude. But Florida's not that fucking state. I don't even I don't even know if I would be. I mean I we are too we are super invested in the state of Florida as far as having a ton of population there, major population centers, um you major need to evacuate Florida. Economic centers. I mean <laughs> I mean at kidding. a certain point. No, no, but, I'm not kidding. Like, what do we do yeah. with Florida, dude? Honestly, the, the place is going to be underwater if we don't get things in order. Exactly. So how do we deal with one of our largest cities, Miami, yeah. one of our most economically important counties yeah. going under? What do we do with that? I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, too hard. God. Uh, stop asking me these questions. God. Voice in my head. Stop. <laughs> I don't know, like, no, because I agree with you is that's the hard thing. Like, I agree that it can't, it feels so not like the right thing to say, um, to say, just let them go under, <laughs> right. right? Just let them, just let them go under, let them lose their homes, let them buy them somewhere else. Who cares? Yeah. But, but this is, this is the problem with, this is generally the problem with government bailouts, right? We've known about the risks of climate change. Like I see TikToks of people making fun of people who say they're excited to move to Florida because they're like, like as if it's going to exist in 10 years. Yeah. You're going to buy property in Florida. Are you fucking stupid? Yeah. God, but so but people do it. And so this is the problem with like, people are taking on the risk and it's not impossible to know that it's risky, but we still decide that the government has to bail them See, out. This is where our inner capitalists and market analy analysts come in right now, because we're talking about the purchasing of homes as investments which is really not how we should be talking about home purchasing. No. Because we're that that we're we're talking about it as if they're commodities, which on our current economic system they are commodities, so that's how it is. Yes. But it's just interesting to me that that's the language we use when we talk about this. Mm. Right. I just, isn't that interesting? It's not right. It's not no, right. And it's and, not. and and when you say that again it makes me think like think of all the people who just grew up in Florida and never left. Right. right, or right. If they were just born there, then it's I, I don't want to punish those people right. for just it's staying so where their hard. home is. Um, God, dude, this sucks. Yeah. God, somebody fix it. Mm. Please. Maybe we just need really, we need incredible like housing technology. We need we, incredible infrastructure that will mean that these houses can never get destroyed no matter how bad the hurricanes are. We should start building cities that are able to live underwater, I think. Yes, underwater or that just have, have raised tunnels between all of the buildings so people don't need to go to the ground level oh i like that idea that that's like that's like bioshock you ever play bioshock i haven't like, played bioshock. no it's like that though they, they'll get it okay they'll know. <laughs> yeah someone someone will get it <laughs> one person <laughs> bioshock was popular anyway <laughs> <laughs> okay should all we right. move on let's do our deep dive yes so we we've been so hot and bothered about unions <laughs> dude recently. i've been rock hard about it <laughs> and we i i felt like i wasn't completely solid so i was solid on the theory of unions which i guess i'll just go straight into on why they're so good for the economy um but i wanted to get more i wanted to know more about the specific evidence that said they were so good so the theory is unions increase bargaining power of workers by monopolizing labor right and monopolizing labor means that the there's a credible threat to a company's production if the labor decides to stop working. That's what's so important because there's too much labor, especially for big companies, right? There are too many workers for any one of them to have real leverage over the company, um, especially at these jobs that might be lower skilled, easier to introduce someone off the street into and have them start working. So by unionizing, um, by having the labor force as a joint 
group that either provides for the company it does or doesn't, they have a lot more power. Um, they have the power to bargain for better wages, which is kind of the most obvious one, right? But they also have the power to bargain for better working conditions and a say in how the company is run, right? Because they, they can use that kind of power to really talk or argue for anything that they want. Mm -hmm. So there are counter arguments that say that a unionized firm would be disadvantaged against its competitors. We've been talking about that a lot in the scope of the UAW, which has Ford, GM, and Stellantis unionized, but not foreign, not Tesla or the foreign car makers like Volvo, Hyundai, Toyota. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, if you can unionize an entire industry, then wages are going to be raised for all. And then there's this idea that, okay, if a, in a perfectly competitive market, those higher wages are going to pass costs onto consumers, except we don't have any perfectly competitive markets. They don't exist at all. We're too far down the road in our capitalism to have perfectly competitive markets, which is why we have about three major companies in every industry. <laughs> in autos, we have maybe six, seven, right? But that's still not enough to be perfectly competitive yeah. by any means. So instead, we can have some of the profits that those companies are taking in by leveraging their market power in markets that are more consolidated than they should be and pass them on to the workers. And that's what unions are so great for. They make it so that these profits, these excess profits the companies are making aren't all just being sucked up to the owners and to the executives, and instead that the workers actually get a share of those. Exactly. And I want to talk about how the literature suggests that unions negatively impact profitability of a company. Mm. So a good research paper I read from Barry Hirsch, this was written in, the, uh, in, the, in 1991, uh, it's titled Union Coverage and Profitability Among U.S. Firms. He found that market value and earnings are estimated to be 10 to 15% lower in an average unionized company than in a non-union company. I think that 10 to 15% number is super interesting because, Ben, what is the wage premium for unions? 10 to 15%. Wow. Look at that. That's crazy. Look at that. That's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. Uh, look at that, guys. Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, that's it's it's exactly right. Yeah. So in one of these papers, right, this guy just he did a regression analysis to figure out um Okay, at companies with unions versus similar companies without unions, what is the difference? And it's funny because I think the wage premium is only this small because of the fact that unions also raise wages for non-union yes. workers working similar jobs. Yes, but we can see that with a direct example with the current raise. I want, we'll get back to the thing in a second. I just yep. want to interject with the Toyota, Hyundai, Tesla. They are all raising their wages in response to the big... A w UAW strike. Yes, absolutely. And so there, there is plenty of evidence that unions, yeah, th this happens all the time, basically. When unions have their wages raised, other companies are incentivized to, even if their employees aren't part of a union, to raise their employees' wages so that the employees don't look around at the other people in the union and decide that they want to leave the company they're working at for another company. Or form a union in the company they're currently in. Yes. So union-dense states are directly correlated with higher um, average earnings per year. Hmm. When we look at high union-dense states, what states are we talking about? We're talking about New York. We're talking about Hawaii, Alaska, Washington, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey, California, Michigan, uh, Oregon. These are Ohio. These are high union-density states. A high union-density state will have, on average, a median household income of $75,000 and seven, uh, $75,000. The median across the country is 70000 and the low union-dense states have median incomes of 63000 This analysis isn't complete. This doesn't account for cost of living. This doesn't account for GDP growth. This is not an in-depth regression analysis. I, we don't have the, I didn't have the time to do all of that. But this is a really good example of high union-dense states having better 
median earnings than yeah. non-union states. And that makes all the sense in the world because we there is also evidence that shows that union workers out-earn non-union workers in almost every occupation. There are a few exceptions, which are business and financial operations, management, computer and mathematical. <clears throat> but a lot of times this means that there are just certain jobs within these occupation groupings that are less likely to be unionized that happen to be higher wage paying jobs, right? And so you're not getting a direct one-to-one -one comparison. I mentioned four exceptions. This is on a list of about 20 different occupations. <laughs> so almost always the unions are getting their workers far more money. Benefits is even a bigger oh, change, yeah. a bigger difference. And this is something that I think most workers, and especially most young people, don't think about because one of the biggest benefits that people get is pensions, right? And we feel like we're so far off from pensions that it's not something that we even consider or mm -hmm. worry about. But that's a huge deal when you're getting close to retirement. And it's estimated that union employees are five times more likely to receive pensions than non-union employees. It's estimated that unionized companies spend 500 to $900 more per person per year on pensions. And there are a swath of benefits that union workers get more of, more of the time um, in every single one. Dude, I'll when I saw this chart, my mind was blown. Isn't this crazy? It's crazy. Yeah. I'll, I'll just read off a few of them, right? Okay. So offered any retirement benefits. You're at like 95% with union workers versus about 70% with non-union workers. Um, offered medical benefits. Again, 95% with union workers, 70% with non-union workers. Offered life insurance. What? About 85% with union workers and about 55% with oh, non-union workers. That's crazy. Child care union workers get more often. Subsidized commuting union workers get more often. Paid jury duty leave union workers get more often. Um, unemployment insurance union workers get at about a 55% rate versus 25% for non-union mem members. Yes. And general and in every single one of these retirement categories union workers get them more often so when we go back and look at the low union density states and the high union density states and we look at those benefits specifically a low union dense state only 18 percent of unemployment unemployment insurance i'm sorry okay hold on in low unionized states, only 18% of workers get access to unemployment insurance. In high unionized states, it's up to 37%. Wow. That's how much of a massive difference That's it makes. huge. When we look at rates of people who don't have health insurance, in low union dense states, 11.3% of workers don't have any health insurance. When we look at high union dense states, it's 6.8%. Now, there is some, obviously, there's other correlating factors here. High union dense states are more likely to have the Medicaid expansion, but that's because unions were able to lobby their local governments to get the Medicaid expansion to, to strengthen their bargaining power right? It's all of this massive cycle. Mm -hmm. And unions are also really good at specifically helping the lowest earners inside of a company. They're really good at helping at, at, at having wage compression. Mm -hmm. So unions um, are super effective for these low wage workers. Um, a great example of this is when we look at what just happened at the United Auto Workers. The United Auto Workers fought very hard to end the two-tier employment system. We see people at Ford who make $18 an hour who are going to be making $40 an hour over the next few years. Wow. A complete doubling of their salaries that's because huge. of unions. Yeah. Because of unions. And that's an amazing, amazing benefit. Yeah. And, I th and not only that, unions are actually shown to increase innovation inside of workplaces. It's wild. A lot of people say like, oh man, if unions get involved, they're going to weaken the company's flexibility and make them really, you know, straight to only one product and not make them be able to move fast. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the case. Workplaces with any union presence, any union presence, not a big one, innovate at 3.88% over seven years, 3.88% uh, more over the seven years of observation as compared to places that have no union presence. When there is a large union presence, it's 6.71% more likely to innovate over that same seven-year time span. And so what... Yeah. Well, to me, that just makes so much sense. Because yeah. I just want to point out, it, 
the unions also they ha- they create a much higher job satisfaction for members of unions. They feel like they're a part of something, and they they are more purpose driven in that. And so, to me, it makes all the sense in the world that those are the people who are doing more innovation. They feel more invested in driving the company forward. Yep, exactly. And what I think is a really good aspect to this. On top of what you just said, where they feel more invested, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the companies are found to invest more in higher risk innovations because they don't get the same amount of profitability increases to the minute marginal changes because more of the profits are being shared with their workers. So management is forced to forego other low cost and potentially more profitable product product strategies to invest in a higher risk, higher return stuff, which Mm -hmm. then ends off paying up more over time. Yeah, that's so cool. It's so cool, dude. It's such a great, it's such a, it's just such an awesome byproduct. And you hear that you're like, oh, wait a second. If that means that some companies are not investing in the low cost and more profitable solutions, does that mean companies fail more often? Well, the answer is no. A Princeton study titled Do Unions Cause More Business Failures found that over the course of an 18-year horizon, there is no difference between unionized workplaces and non-unionized workplaces on business dislocation rates. Amazing. Yeah. The one thing that I did find as far as a negative view on unions compared to office closures is that they likely happen because companies shut down the unionized plants in an attempt to cancel any union activity at the company and to make sure it doesn't spread, like containing a disease. Right, and we saw that at Starbucks. Starbucks Mm -hmm. unions went all over the place. In upstate New York, I remember there was one town that had a lot of Starbucks, and they, they shut down all the Starbucks in that town except for the one that wasn't a union. Of course. Classic. So if you're going to use that as evidence that unions shut down company plants, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Basically, yeah. that's what yeah. I mean it's, by that. It's a self-reinforcing kind of line of logic. Yes. I want to talk about equality slash equity for a minute because there is kind of an obvious way where unions, um, unions help with gender and racial equality in the economy because everybody who signed onto the contract under the union has to be treated the same. Right? You don't have to worry about the wage gap. You don't have to worry about different working conditions. Everyone is treated the same way, and that's exactly what we want when people are working the same jobs and producing the same. Right. So I think that's a fantastic note. But also as far as inequity in the economy, right? Concentration of wealth and income at the top versus that at the bottom. Unions are amazing for this. There's one paper that found that the rise of unions accounted for about half of the 20% decline in the 90 to 10 income ratio. That means the incomes that you receive if you're in the top, if you're in the 90th percentile or higher, um, or versus the income that you receive if you're in the 10th percentile or lower, right? So between 1938 and 1968, there was a huge decline in that ratio, and unions accounted for about half of that decline. Meanwhile, another paper found that deunionization from 1979 to 2017 accounted for 13% of the increase in that 90 to 10 ratio during that span. And if you look at the spillover effects to what happened to the wages of non-union workers in similar jobs, then that number goes up to half. Wow. So unions have a huge effect on the level of economic Um, disparity, I guess, between the top and the bottom. Other studies looked at the perspective from different locations, different states, rather than different time periods. And one found that across states, a 10 percentage point increase in union membership leads to a 6 percentage point decrease in the 90 to 10 ratio. Wow. That's huge. And that's why I think it excites us so much to see all this new union activity. It feels like it's going to compress wages, drive the economy forward in that way. Mm -hmm. So then the other thing I had to talk about was productivity. Okay. So there's, there is an idea like productivity could be affected by unions negatively because you'll get free riders, people who join in and belong to a union and then are harder to fire if they do bad work because of that. But 
Researchers have actually found many cases of unions that improve productivity. Exactly. So notable examples come from the healthcare sector, where one paper in 2016 showed that patient outcomes improved in hospitals where registered nurses unionized compared to patient outcomes in hospitals without nurse unions. And the largest quality improvement occurred in the year of unionization. And so that's where really, to me, the morale factor comes in. The yeah. investment in what you're doing, the satisfaction, right? It is. It makes a real difference. Money isn't everything yeah. in how people do their work. Absolutely. Um, and I want to interject another yeah. one because another public sector union that gets a lot of hate is teachers unions. Yep. When you look at studies that analyze the effect of teachers unions, teacher unions improve test scores for people in the the later ages of middle school, seventh and eighth grade have higher test scores in the, when they get taught by a by a uh, union, who, a teacher who's a part of a teacher's union than not. And that's a really important thing to talk about because the teacher's union's making your child's education even better, not worse. Yeah, that's that's huge. I mean, and I think that's going to be the case in most in most sectors, right? In most industries, um, there is a point that strikes can have short term effects on productivity, which is obvious. But mm-hmm. they pave the way for the long term benefits that we're just talking about now. There is one study that was interesting. It found that labor conflict in the Rust Belt in the '80s led to a decline in the employment share of the Rust Belt. And I think this is something that opponents of unionization do talk about a lot, right? With right to work states, for example, in the South or something, basically more of these jobs that generally belong to unions go to states where they don't need to employ unions. Mm. Um, To me, it's an argument to unionize everything, unionize everything. Yeah. To make the laws even more favorable towards unionizing to get rid of these right to work laws right even out the playing field stop the race to the bottom yeah that's why we need to pass the pro act which has the best provision of if you get half more 50 percent plus one of your workplace to sign on to union cards then the union is automatically formed you don't have to have the election which can be um tampered with not tampered with that's not the right word but heavily influenced by your employer if you get the union card signed 50 plus one you have a union pass the pro act call your representative to do that because that's the most important piece of legislation we could pass to strengthen the labor movement yeah that's huge because because think of being the first person at your company with the idea to start a union right you're going to be facing so much heat even imagining doing that you're going to be so discouraged because you're putting yourself out there like you're the lamb going to the slaughter Mm -hmm. and that's super scary. But if you can just go around to your coworkers and people at your level and try to casually ask them, say, you just need to sign this card, that's going to make it so much more possible. Yeah. And we love unions, baby. Listen, unions don't go far enough. I want there to be some more managerial opportunities for these unions. I want the unions to be a little more in charge of some of the business decisions in a lot of cases. Mm. But unions are a great place to start. And Absolutely. we fucking love them. Huge. All right, dude. I think we're done. I'm good. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Bye, people. See you next week.